Well, these are interesting times in our state, interesting times in the country. We have a lot of issues, complicated issues on the ballot coming up, and I know you've been hearing about those all day in this room. So uh, hopefully you've walked away with a little better understanding, a little more information than you did before, and that will be my objective here today as well. This um, is an area that I had to learn a lot about in my capacity as Secretary of Commerce, because when I served, the state's workforce development initiatives were all housed in the Commerce Department. And so I collaborated very carefully and very closely with the people on the cabinet who knew a lot more about education issues than I did. Uh, but it really elevated my understanding and it caused me to develop some pretty strong feelings about what I think the steps should be to help us get to where we need to be on the education front. We have a lot of challenges. So one is um, the issue we're facing in the upcoming November ballot, which is a sales tax proposal that's going to be facing all of us. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that today, and I'm going to give you some fairly deep background on the issue so you can take it and you can absorb it and you can determine for yourself, you know, what your position should be and how you feel about it. I know that in your capacity, um, it's, it's you know, not, not going to be your primary task to go out and advocate for this one way or the other, but you have friends and you have family members, and whatever your feeling is, you should get busy about making your view known in, in the appropriate way. So, because I think this has profound impact. So let's go through it. It's going to take us a while to go through it. I'll try not to make it uh, boring, but, but there are a lot of details here. And I just want to put a face on it, and a number of faces. And I want to start with this premise. And I think it's one we should be clear about. I'm going to be very blunt about this. We're lying to our children. When those kids walk across that auditorium floor, or in some of our smaller schools when they walk across that stage. And I can remember the days in my high school in Northwest Missouri where the stage served as the basketball court. Anybody remember those days? When they walk across that floor and someone hands them a parchment that gives them a high school diploma, we give them the explicit understanding that they are prepared for the next step. So I want you to think about that, and I want you to see how you feel about that as we walk through this. Let's review the situation. We know we have a weak economy. Uh, just as a back note, we have five ecosystems here in Oklahoma. Two of those five ecosystems are pure commodities. Oil and gas, i.e. the energy business, and the agriculture business. And frankly, we don't have any ability to control the revenue that's generated from those. The revenue comes in and it goes out to state coffers based exclusively and almost entirely on the price of, that, of those products. And let me tell you, I'm not defending anyone, but from a state budgeting point of view, that's a nightmare. Because what you have is this going on with these wide variations of revenue and yet you have this ever-increasing demand from all parties to want what? More or less money? Always more. So it makes it a real challenge. And I would say that whether it was, we were talking about Democrats or Republicans, that's an apolitical statement. But we have this weak economy, we have this wide variance in revenue, and the revenues are down significantly. And you know the story about the agencies having to suffer the cuts. That fell particularly hard on K through 12. And we read about the four day school days. And we read about the lack of supplies. And we read about all the problems. And I don't want to minimize any of those. Those are real problems. And then most importantly, and what this initiative on the ballot is about in November, is about teacher retention and shortages. And believe me, that's a real issue. I mean, there are, there are many, many papers and many, many long studies that go into careful detail about what's going on. I'm going to spend some time on 
some of those as we go through this so that we just have a clear understanding. We have literally over a thousand unfilled teaching slots in Oklahoma. I don't know of anyone, with rare exception, that wouldn't like to see our teachers paid better and paid more. I'd love to see them, I, I wish we had a system where we could pay them fifty to $100,000 a year and treat them as the professionals we would all like to have standing in front of our children and grandchildren. Because be clear, every report that I read, everything that I've studied tells me and reinforces this point. The number one determinant of a successful outcome in that classroom is the person standing in front of it. Now that doesn't minimize or take away the cultural issues and the poverty issues. Those are all things that are indigenous to that child's life. Whether they come from a great family, not a great family, economically well off, not economically well off, those are all factors as well. But once that child walks through that classroom, that teacher makes a big difference. That teacher is the difference. And every one of you in this room can remember one, two, three teachers that you can think back and remember by name and with specificity. And the fact that when she pointed at you in the seventh grade, her finger went that way and she was looking it right at you. So you get the point. Those people have a big impact on the lives of our children. So with all those issues out there, we have this impasse. We have this dilemma. And we can't seem to get it resolved. And the legislature gives lip service to the idea of giving teachers more money, and then nothing gets done. And that seems to go on and on for some time. And I must tell you, you know, operating within the, in a framework, a budget framework of the kind we were talking about this year, where you have $1.3 billion short of a $7 billion budget, that's going to squeeze everyone, school districts included. And I, I know most of you probably know this, but again, it's a good reminder of the revenue that comes into the state. This needs to be, this needs to be worked on so badly. Of the revenue that comes into the state, the state legislators only get to appropriate about 44, 45% of it. Okay? So by the time it even gets to them, after all the earmarks off the top, for ARC payments on pension and roads and bridges and other priorities that our previous legislatures have decided they wanted. You know, I'm not, I'm not arguing whether they should be there or not, but they're there. And it takes all, scrapes all that money off the top and it leaves the people at 23rd and Lincoln with about half, with less than half of the money that comes in to divvy up and appropriate. And again, no defense to any of them. But I want you to remember that as we go through this, we hear about a number of teachers running for public office, and I will remind you that the appropriation and budget chairman in the House this year, the chairman and vice chairman had 54 years of experience in education among, between them. There are teachers and administrators already in powerful positions. And the vice chair, one of those ladies, Katie Hinkey from Tulsa, comes from an education background. There are more educators in the state legislator than lawyers. Things are sometimes not what they seem to be. Because of this impasse, now we have President Boren coming along and recommending a one cent sales tax increase, state sales tax increase, that's a tax increase on that specific number of 22%. I have a real challenge with that because number one, it changes our constitution. I don't know if you've had a chance to see our constitution. When I was Secretary of State, it was our responsibility to take care of the constitution. Things about that thick. Part of the reason is, is because it has all the, all the real property descriptions of every piece of property in Oklahoma in it. It's quite the interesting document. But well, we've really loaded up this Constitution. And I would just remind you of all the problems with governing California has because they have defaulted to a referendum type of government. 
and it's virtually impossible for their legislature to get anything done. So we should be very, very careful and very, very cautious, whether or not we're in favor of an issue or not, to do it by referendum and make it a permanent part of the Constitution, because that is a forever deal. More on that in a moment. So here's what I'd like for you to think about. You are an investor. You have a billion dollars in your pocket. You have money to spend. And Mr. Boren wants a meeting with you, and he wants to sit down, and he wants to tell you why you should spend your money with him. And I want you to imagine the kind of questions that you might be asking as you go through that conversation. He comes to you and he says, I'm asking you to agree to a 22% increase in the state sales tax rate, and I want you to give of that billion dollars, $600 million to education. And the first thing you're gonna ask, I'm guessing is, you're gonna ask a lot of questions. You're gonna say, well, why are you asking me for $600 million? That's no small amount of money. And you're gonna hear him say things like, which Carolyn and I heard him say uh, yesterday at Rotary, well, we need to invest more in education. Well, okay. And we rank 48th or 49th out of 50th in terms of teacher pay. We have these shortages and we're headed to last place. We're just about to get to last place quickly. That we have, we're losing all kinds of outstanding graduates. We're losing a generation of children. See, that makes it a pretty emotional appeal. We're losing a generation or two of children. I would ask him simply this. What about the children we've lost in the last two or three generations? And you'll see the reason why I say that. And then you're gonna say, if you're an investor, or this is somebody coming pitching you this deal, you're gonna say, well, tell me how the money's gonna be spent, and you see it outlined there. And you see how it's broken down. Teacher pay increases, of course. Higher education, early childhood programs, and career tech. So that's the breakout. Well, I'm gonna also wanna ask, and you probably would too, well, what else has been done over the past few years? Well, you might be surprised to know that districts can already offer a bonus. Payment for either retention or recruiting. And you might also be surprised to know that we've taken some steps to make it easier for out-of-state teachers to come to Oklahoma. OU, in fact, where he works, started a debt-free teaching program for students who will teach a certain length of time in Oklahoma. And by the way, in terms of onboarding teachers, a key ingredient to the, that success is mentoring. Well, we abandoned ours in 2010. Now, somebody explain that to me. If it's a, if it's a known, known ingredient to a successful onboarding of a teacher and we abandon it, that doesn't make any sense. And we finally reinstated it in 2014. Well, I'm gonna to wanna to know from Mr. Bourne, well, what, a, what problems is it gonna solve? Are you telling me that if we give you $600 million, and by the way, again, this is forever, that that's gonna solve all the retention or recruiting problems for teachers we have in Oklahoma. And just as a side note, you see what USA Today and another study say about teachers already being in turmoil, much turnover within that profession. Tough to get them in, tough to keep them engaged, tough to keep them in place. And just like any business, turnover is the death knell blow. It just costs so much to bring people on, get them trained, get, get them acclimated, get them to buy into the culture, get them to be effective and productive. And we have a, roughly half of the people who come don't stay more than five years. So again, it is a real problem, it's a real challenge. One quote that I read as to why they abandoned the profession, they felt overwhelmed, ineffective, and unsupported. No mention of money. So let's take a closer look. Starting salary for teachers higher than it is in the private sector for a college graduate. Now 10 years down the road, 
that private sector person is going to pass the teacher in most cases. We also have a lot of teacher retirements going on. That's why some of the vacancies have come, are coming, uh, coming open. And we have an effort to reduce the class size. Well, anytime you reduce class size, you know you're going to need more teachers, right? So I'm not saying that's artificially created, but it's a conscious decision that many school districts are making. Were the objective to have smaller class sizes? Probably. But there are studies out there that show teachers around the world in different countries, high achieving academic countries are able to teach 60 students in one class, effectively. So I'm not so sure. I need to know more before I make any conclusion about that. And nationally and in Oklahoma, there are fewer teaching graduates than we've had before. Drilling even deeper. Now stay with this one. This one's, this one's rather interesting. There are 245 elementary, secondary employees for 10,000 residents. That's higher than all but 11 states. That's what we have in Oklahoma. Teachers' pay, on the other hand, is lower than most states. And what that suggests to me is that we are prioritizing quantity over quality. In other words, we have some options there. And that also leads me to think that maybe we have some inefficiency going on here, which could be cleaned up. And I believe, and other people believe, that that plays a significant role in lower teacher pay. Now we're back to the, the born request. One thing I'm going to want to know and want to get to remind him of is, well, 600 million more dollars out of my pocket. Keep in mind that of the appropriated budget, I already give you over 51% of what we currently budget for all education, K through 12, higher ed, career tech, etc. Already getting more than half of it. So how are we going to make the decision? Now you know, switch hats here. Now you're no longer an investor, now you're a legislator. So what's it going to be? Education or public safety? Is it going to be public safety or is it going to be Medicaid? Is it going to be Medicaid or is it going to be roads and bridges? What are you going to do, Mr. and Mrs. Legislator? How are you going to pick and choose? You have a limited amount of money, you have infinite demand for that money. And your job at the end of the day comes down to choosing priorities. And when you choose education, you're going to cut back on mental health. And when you cut back on mental health, you're going to hear about it from the corrections people and all the incarceration arguments and all the criminal justice arguments, etc. And when you cut back on roads and bridges, you're going to hear about all the unsafe roads and bridges we have. And part of the earmarks that we established years ago was to take money off the top to repair those systematically over a long period of time. That's a decision that the legislature made. Not arguing that whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm taking you through this exercise to share with you the challenges that all people at 23rd and Lincoln have, Democrat and Republican, doesn't matter. So you take the money, but is there any proof that the money I give you is going to solve any of those problems? The Cato Institute says no to all those. Any proof that we'll have a quick turnaround in, reten in recruitment? No. Retention for $5,000 a year? Probably not. Because folks who are upset about teaching today are upset about more than money. Some of them are upset because they can't walk through the front door without fearing for their life. Some of them are upset because they work with incompetent principals. Some of them are upset because they don't get support in mentoring and training. And they don't get challenged to grow and become, become better as a professional. Well, one thing I'm going to ask Mr. Boren is, you want more money? Well, before I make an investment, I usually ask people to share their track record. And so I'm going to want to flush out what that track record is. And he's going to have to show me the numbers on that screen. He's going to have to show me that in tests, our children in this state rank 39th and 46th. That's pathetic. 71% not proficient in, re in, uh, in reading, 
68% not proficient in math. And oh, by the way, if you looked at the fourth grade numbers and compared them to the eighth grade numbers, between the fourth grade and the eighth grade, they deteriorate. They get worse. Something that I don't know the answer to is happening between four and eight. I don't know what it is. Something's happening. And in all the evaluations, all the teachers are, you know, virtually all of them are rated effective. Well, what does that tell you? Well, first of all, it tells you that can't be right. <laughs> that just isn't right. So there's no accountability. I mean, there's nobody really holding people's feet to the fire and say, let's get with it and let's be sure we're being effective in that classroom. And if you're not getting the results you want, what can we do what, to help you? What can we do to build you up? What can we do to train you better? What can we do to support you? That's not happening. And then, Mr. Boren, let me remind you that when people come to your college, out of Oklahoma high schools, 39% of them, almost 40% of them require remediation. That means they have to take classes because they're not ready for the college level training and they have to take the class, pay for it, and get no credit. And we've all read about the A through F grading system and we know where we are on that. I'm also going to want to ask Mr. Bourne about efficiency. How many of you in the room contribute to charities? Church, charities, most of us do. How many of you when you contribute to a charity have ever asked yourself the question, well I wonder what percentage of my dollar is actually going to the program and what percentage is going to administration or gosh knows what? Anybody ask that question? Wouldn't it be a fair question to ask in this case? This is a public donation of our money to a charity. And I'd want to know, well, how efficient are we on the administrative side? And guess what? They'd have to talk to us about the 500 plus school districts. More than Florida, sixth highest in the nation in administrative costs. You see the screen. Governing Magazine says of Oklahoma, the high number of Oklahoma districts fuels administrative bloat and waste. Now look, how many of you are from communities of less than 1,500 people? So I'm not sure what the magic is to that number, but you're gonna, you live on my point right here. I was born and raised in a little bitty town in Northwest Missouri. And I know very clearly the implications and the impact that that local school has, that that local post office has, that that local bank has, and how meaningful those institutions are to those towns. I totally get that. Somehow we're gonna to have to resolve this. I'm not sure what the answer is. There'll be battles and blood before it's resolved. Demographics may take care of some of it, sadly. My little town's not doing so well. I was up there two weekends ago in county seat town, beautiful old courthouse. These little tuck pointing work. But two of those four sides of the square are virtually gone. A few of them moved out to the highway. That makes a little sense, maybe. But you get the point. So it's going to be a challenge. But we do have some administrative issues to confront and to deal with that need to be streamlined quite a bit. Now, you live where the other implications reside. In my old world of economic development at the Commerce Department, I can tell you that when this passes, and the current polling is about 62% in favor, when this passes, and despite that I'm still not sure it will, when this passes, and if it passes, the first thing the Tax Foundation in Washington, D.C. is going to do is they're going to take a hard look at Oklahoma and going to rate us less competitive on the economic development front than we are today. They've already hammered us a little bit because we can't seem to get a hold of our state budget. We have this sales tax pyramiding thing. Perhaps you've heard about that. You've lived that too. See, sales tax gets paid at every level through the production system. It hits manufacturing particularly hard. It's just not the sales tax you see at the cash register when you go out to dinner. It's all the sales tax that's paid at all the intermediate 
steps in between. So it all adds up. And of course, you guys are sales tax dependent. And it has a huge impact on you. And part of the reform that's included in this needs to be giving communities the right to change this and being sure that you have the ability to tap into revenue sources that you currently can't tap into. Because when you couple the impact of internet sales and the impact of this increase in the sales tax, your job just got a lot more difficult. Because the next time you want to go to your good folks and say we need more money for legitimate reasons, for safety, police, sewers, whatever, your, jo your job just got a little more difficult, didn't it? Because voters are eventually going to reach a tipping point where they say enough's enough. I mean, I can't imagine what would happen in Oklahoma City, this MAPS deal. I mean, what? <laughs> I don't know what would have happened. Can't tell. I don't know if 10.5% is the, is the trigger point, the tipping point. I don't know if it's 14%. But I can tell you when the conversation starts along the lines of, <clears throat> We have a higher state sales tax rate than Connecticut <laughs> or New York. People are going to start scratching their heads and say, well, what's that all about? And we also know that sales tax is regressive. You know, it impacts our less fortunate or less able economically than any other group. Now, back to a point that I made earlier. There's no accountability in this plan. Mr. Boren, there's no accountability. We're putting this in the Constitution. It is permanent. There's no oversight. There's no sunset provision on this for us to go back and revisit it in five years. There's no way that we can take a change in circumstances or a change in priorities and do anything about this. This is a lockdown deal. In fact, Carolyn, he used the term what, lockbox? Yesterday at Rotary, he said, this is a lockbox for money. <laughs> you bet it is. But he forgot to tell you about the siphon out of your pocketbook straight into that lockbox. And it's going to impact everyone. So I'm going to listen to him, and I'm going to ask him these questions. And my conclusion is going to be, well, Mr. Bourne, you're not making a very good case. Not to me. Not on a standalone basis. And he's going to come back and he's going to say, well, what would it take you to invest? I'm going to make a couple of observations to him that I made to the group of Oklahoma presidents of universities two years ago. Glenn Johnson invited me to speak to them. And I said, Glenn, are you sure you want me to speak to them? Because you know what I'm going to say. He said, no, they need to hear it. And so I mentioned to them that as a businessman, I live in a world of creative destruction. When I go to work in the morning at 8 o'clock, I don't know if at 5 o'clock that afternoon my business model will even be viable. And I may not even know it's no longer viable for some period of time until I reach into my bank account and there's nothing left. That free capitalism, free enterprise system is living and dying, regenerating every day, every second, every moment, at a rate faster and faster than we've ever experienced before. True? And all of our lives are the same way. We've become a microwave, instant replay, instant response society. Things change quickly. Some days I'd love to go back to Big Chief Tablets and number two lead pencils. Amen. Amen. We live in a world of creative destruction, and Mr. Bourne, many of us believe that you live in a world of creative protection, where nothing changes, where the only answer is more money to be the solution to the problem. And you're a charity coming to me, and you're asking for more and more money every year, and the output and what you're telling my child when they walk across that stage and take that parchment is not what I want to hear. And you've got to do better. I'd love to see teachers make a lot of money. I'd love to see teachers treated as professionals. Wouldn't you love to feel so good about that person standing in front of your children's classroom or your grandchildren's classroom knowing that they're getting the best of the best? We'd all love to see that. And you know what? That's possible. That can happen. 
but it's going to take a lot of vision, a lot of hard work, a lot of pounding of tables, some pretty profound arguments, I'm guessing. But what I would want from you, Mr. Boren, to get my money is I want a track record. I want a willingness to lead reform. I don't believe that this is a singular, insulated, unilateral step of me just giving you more money. I believe that this requires a conversation between the two of us, and I believe it requires a commitment for you to improve performance, processes, and outcomes. And I want to ask you this. Why aren't you, at the peak of your influence, a former governor, a former United States senator, an influential one, highly respected by people throughout literally the world, why are you just talking about money and not leading the reform conversation and coupling those two together and making a difference on the side of the equation that you know really matters in terms of changing outcomes? Because I get tired of hearing from you, we just need more money. I'm sorry. Carolyn asked me to speak. She didn't know what she was getting into. <laughs> so, Mr. Bourne, here's the grade I give your plan. You want to talk about education? I think you need to do some more homework. And I know you can do it. I know you have the capability of doing it. He might say, well, tell me what I have to do. And I would remind him again that I think it takes a coupling of reform and funding. It takes both topics at the table. It's going to take a willingness to open up and talk about competition, whether that comes through education savings accounts, expanded charters, a more rigorous path to become a teacher, consolidation, teacher tenure, the list goes on and on and on. Of steps that we can take that are going to make a long-term difference with the objective being that we get the highest trained professional caliber person in the, in the world in front of that classroom. That's the objective. And it's just not about the money and that's really the overriding point today. And he's gonna look at me and say, well, we're not gonna do that. And I say, well, oh, I know you're not. You're not going to do it because you're afraid. This is a fear-based environment they live in. It's a monopoly run by a monopoly. Think about that. It's also one of the strongest lobby organizations in Oklahoma. They're good people. These teachers are good people. They're just fighting from their point of view. No one can blame them for that, right? But everybody fears them. If a state legislator gets a call from six teachers, it just, they, they quake in their boots. They think there's a movement out there, you know, an overwhelming feeling of a position. And they've decided to protect the system. They've backed down. And I'm critical of our legislature about this. They had a golden opportunity and they, they, they dropped back 10 and they punted and they didn't even get the ball past the line of scrimmage. They, declined to, they decided to protect the system and they wanted to continue lying to our children. And to me, that's unacceptable. They traded our children's future for the status quo. You don't tolerate that in your family. You don't tolerate that where you work. We shouldn't tolerate it in the institution that has the most impact on our children and grandchildren, the future of this country, of our communities. So we see the stranglehold. They oppose testing of, and, and look, Maybe there are too many tests, I don't know, but most of the tests are imposed by the districts, not by the state. So I don't know what the right test should be, but you have to have some testing to see if people are actually learning something. And you have to know whether, how we're doing and how we're competing, not just nationwide, but worldwide. And by the way, you probably know, but of the major OECD nations around the world, we're 17th out of 34. This is the United States of Great America. We're middle of the Packers, folks. We have a lot, to work, lot of work to do on education. Students not prepared, no accountability. We want them to be professionals. We want to pay them as professionals. So reform. And what I would ask you to do is rather than focus on what's going in your, po going in your pocketbook, I'd like to see you focus for a change on the child on what's happening in the life of that child and what they're walking across that stage and receiving. And I kid a little bit and say, you know what, if I'm, if I'm just looking at the record, I have to remind you, your record's worse than Travis Ford's. You know, and he got fired. 
And back to the fear, I think most of them fear that if Oklahoma had education savings accounts or charter schools across the state, I think they fear that there'd be zero kids show up in their school. And you know what? They might be right. But why shouldn't we challenge them and use that fear for them to get better? They can get better. They can do it. It's just nobody's forced them to. Nobody's held their feet to the fire and say, this is the new deal. This is the new world. You bring me that partnership attitude, you bring that reform and funding conversation together, and I'm all in. I'd love nothing better than to support this because we all want the same thing for those children. And that is for them to walk into their adult life fully prepared, excited, knowing that they can compete on the highest level with anyone in the world. So what I would have you think about is simply this. I'm going to vote no on this proposition. I'm not a troglodyte. I don't, I'm not opposed to teachers. I love teachers and the role they play. But this needs to be addressed a little differently. And we need to get on the legislators and tell them to do their job so that things like this don't come up. This is coming up as a reaction to a job not being done. And by the way, that's not just about Republicans, and or that's about, not about Democrats or Republicans, it's about all of them. There's a job not being done. There's all kinds of shenanigans that went on at the last minute in the last legislature where different parties were holding up some initiatives chosen by other party, the other party. So it gets a little bit murky and muddy out there. So anyway, thank you for allowing me to come and share my thoughts. Carolyn, thank you for inviting me. Folks, thank you so much. I appreciate your time and attention. Thank you. <clears throat>